the Bachelor Baptist College who identifies Calvinists and believes that Jesus died for only the elect. Not on your life would we have somebody teaching on our faculty. First Timothy 2 and verse 4, who would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. First Timothy 2 and verse 6, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Titus 2.11, for the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared unto all men. Hebrews 2 and verse 9, Jesus tasted death for every man. You know the gospel I preach, Mark, and go downtown in Norfolk and find a drunkard, find a drug addict, find a drug seller, and I can say Jesus had you in mind when he died on Calvary. You say, I've had an abortion. He wants you this morning. You say, well, I've been a pornographer. He wants you this morning. I, I have told our preacher boys for years, don't buy anything retail. You can always find it wholesale. Everything I buy, I buy on a bargain. I got these shoes on a bargain. I got this sport coat on a bargain. Everything I buy, I buy on a bargain. When I got my wife, <laughs> man, did she, did I get a bargain. Now, she got the short end of it, but I got the bargain. I was sitting on the back row in 1953 of an area-wide meeting in Asheville, North Carolina. The evangelist said, there's a young man in here tonight whose God is popularity. His God is himself. You know what I said? Who told him I was here? <laughs> Somebody's told him all about me. He said, you come to Christ. I said, I can't go. If I go, my friends will see me go. He said, if you'll take that first step, you'll have no trouble with the second. The back row of the balcony, 3,000 people, I started down the aisle. And I know that counselor was glad to get rid of me. I almost drowned him with my tears. And he said, God has promised he'll remove your sins as far as the east is from the west and remember them against you no more. I said, I want that. And may I say, 67 years ago, I was born again. Ladies and gentlemen, he wants you for salvation. Take your Bible, keep your finger here, turn to Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 20. Not only does he want you for salvation, he wants you for service. Matthew 4, 18 through 20. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net in the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. All right, look this way. I want you to know these fellows were not fishing to pass the time a day away. This was their occupation. But when they fell in love with Jesus, they left their nets, they forgot about their occupation and became fishers of men. Here's the connotation. If you're following Jesus, you're gonna be involved in soul winning. If you're not involved in soul winning, then you're not following Jesus Christ. 1975, we took our first mission field trip to Kenya, Africa. And I came back and was really stirred up about getting labors to go to Kenya. And I preached in Albuquerque, New Mexico in January. God reached down that service and he saw Dr. Ralph Stewart, a PhD in science, already making a six-figure salary 1976, and God reached down and he said, Ralph Stewart, I don't want you wasting your life in the chemical laboratory. I want you in my service. He left his nets. He went to Maranatha Baptist Bible College as a professor in biology, making $15,000 a year. He went from a six-figure salary to $15,000 a year. 
Last I heard, Ralph Stewart was pastoring a church in southern Illinois that he started. He was willing to leave his nets. How about you? I preached in 1980 in Marshalltown, Iowa. God looked down in that meeting and he saw Bob Batney, superintendent of the public school system, high paying, prestigious job. And God reached down and he said, Bob Matney, I want you in my service. He left his nets, went to Newington, Connecticut, headmaster of a Christian school, making half the salary he was making in Marshalltown, Iowa. I preached pastor in that chapel in that school where he was headmaster. 47 young people came down the aisle and surrendered for full-time Christian service. Bob Matney got up before his young people with tears in his eyes. He said, young people, five years ago in a Ron Comfort meeting, I did the same thing you're doing today. He said, but you know what? If I spent all of my life in the public school, I could never see 47 young people surrender for full-time Christian service. God is asking you this morning, are you willing to leave your nets? He wants you for service. I preached in 1961 after graduating from college in a little country church in, near Clarksburg, West Virginia. Little did I need, know the girl that played the piano would get saved in that meeting and she would turn out to be my wife. I had to marry her to do follow-up work. And uh, we've almost had 60 years of a wonderful follow-up course. But not only did Joyce get saved in that meeting, her cousins Eddie and Edna Bartlett got saved in that meeting. Eddie Bartlett was when he was a baby, he was dropped on his head and his brain was slightly damaged. And I'm saying he belonged in the institution, but I'm saying he spoke with a thick, stammering tongue, just not quite average mentally. Many years ago, after hearing me preach one night, Eddie Bartlett came to me and he said, Brother Ron, Brother Ron, he said, last week I went out and I found me an old drunk, and I led him to deed the Christ. He said, Brother Ron, since I've been saved, I've led 27 people to deed the Christ. I looked at Eddie Bartlett that night, and tears welled up in my eyes. And I said, Dear God, have mercy on my cold heart. If Eddie Bartlett could win 27 people to Christ, every Christian in this building could too, if you'd leave your nets. All right, in closing, go back to Luke 19 and verse 5. It says, and when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him, he sees me, and said unto him, Zacchaeus, he knows me. Make haste and come down, he wants me, for today... I must abide at thy house. What do you think his last thought was? I think it was this. He loves me. My, what a thought. He loves me. You know, for 15 years of my life, I never knew that anybody loved Ron Comfort. My grandmother told me that when I was six months old, she walked into our third-story apartment in Brooklyn, New York, saw my mother take me in her arms, was about to drop me from a three-story window. My grandmother grabbed me out of my mother's arms, threw my mother on the bed. If my grandmother had delayed five minutes, I would have been a dead baby laying on the streets of Brooklyn, New York. I can remember at the age of four, walking the sidewalk, picking up cigarette butts off the street and smoking them. At the age of six, running around with a gang. You say, that's preposterous. A six-year-old running around with a gang? Hey, we lived in the Bedford-Stuyvesant area, the worst area of all of Brooklyn. And in that area, you were either in a gang or you were the object of a gang. And my brother, who was four years older than I, and I felt... It would be better to be in the gang than to be the object of a gang.
Every one of us in the gang had a pair of brass knuckles just waiting for a little boy or little girl to be walking the store by themselves so we could beat them to a bloody pulp. I can remember, ladies and gentlemen, seeing my mother leave. My dad was in the military station in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Every week he would send home $20 as an allotment for mother to buy groceries for four children. Instead of buying groceries, my mother would spend days on end in the saloons and taverns. Many were the days we never saw my mother. Many were the days my brother would go to the fruit stand, steal fruit off of the fruit stand so four little children could have something to eat. I can remember seeing my mother take a broom handle and beat my sister Eleanor across the bare back with a broom handle until the blood appeared on her spine. My sister, five years older than I, about 15 years ago, died of cancer in Hendersonville, North Carolina. But before she died, she said, Ronnie, up and down my spine as an adult woman are still scars from where I was beaten as an 11 and a 12-year-old girl. Many mornings I saw Eleanor run out the door, putting on her slip, putting on her dress to escape the beating of the broom handle. Some of the things that I saw as a little boy, I did not understand, but I shall never erase those scenes from my mind. I can remember coming home from the first grade, trying to get into our third story apartment. And there was an article of furniture pushed against the apartment door, obviously to keep anybody from entering. So with my little body, I pushed and I pushed and I pushed, and finally I pried the door open just enough to squeeze my little body through. I'm sorry I did. You know what I saw? I saw my mother and the landlord having immorality on the living room couch. And this was the way my mother paid her rent every month, by having immorality with the landlord. Many were the nights my mother would go down on the streets of Brooklyn, taking men off the street that we had never seen in our lives and have immorality right in front of four little children. When I was seven years old, my mother and father received a divorce. My mother realized she could not live like she wanted to live and care for four children. This is what she did. She took three of us, put us on a bus like a package. She put a tag around my brother's neck and the tag read, these children are the property of William Comfort in Elmire, New York. See that he gets these children. At the time, we had a two-year-old sister, Connie, whom mother felt was too young to travel. Do you know, I had only seen Connie twice in 38 years. And after years of praying, I preached in Brooklyn in 1981, and God reconciled my sister and me together. And Connie made a profession of faith. I've thought about that, Pastor. What if my mother had said, Ronnie's only seven. I'll keep him back with Connie because he's too young to put on the bus. You know what? You would not have a preacher that I am standing behind this pulpit this morning. I'd have never been saved. I'd never heard the gospel. The, uh, Ambassador Baptist College would never become a reality. We have over a thousand of our graduates around the world serving the Lord. That would have never happened if my mother had said, I'm gonna keep Ronnie back with me. My mother committed herself to a mental institution, are you listening, because of alcohol. Hey, don't talk to me about should a Christian uh, socially drink. Don't you talk to me about that. I know what it did to my mother. She spent 35 to 40 years in mental institutions all over New York and Pennsylvania. She died in the Elmire, New York Psychiatric Center in 1991 because of alcohol. And I remember what my brother and sister looked like when we got on the bus that day. My brother had on a pair of trousers that were tied around him with a rope. 
My sister had on a dress that had more holes in it than it had material. My brother and sister were nothing but a stack of skin and bones. When we got to Elmira, New York, Dad didn't know we were coming. So when we got off the bus, we started looking around the bus depot to see if we could find Dad. The police saw our plight. Policeman came over and said to my brother, what are you kids doing? He said, well, our mother sent us from Brooklyn to Elmira, and we thought our dad would be here to meet us. So he took us around the bus depot, still no sign of dad. He said, I'll tell you what we're going to do. He said, we're going to take you down to the police station, and we're going to feed you a meal. I want to say those policemen treated us so kindly that night. We had a meal like we had not had in such a long time. And after the meal, the policeman said, now, we're going to take you down to a children's shelter. You'll spend the night in the children's shelter, and we guarantee you we'll find your dad. He'll claim you tomorrow. So the next day in the afternoon, dad came down, claimed his three children. On the way home, I never will forget what he said. He said, kids, do you remember the woman I brought to Brooklyn and I introduced her to you as your Aunt Roxy from the South? He said, no, she wasn't your Aunt Roxy from the South. She was my girlfriend and now she's my wife and she's going to be your mother the rest of your lives. Let me say the next eight years of my life were filled with nothing but fear. Oh, how I hated to see those weekends come. I knew my daddy would have his drunken buddies in and we would see fighting and immorality and hear cursing. Many Saturday nights, I never slept a wink all night long. Well, after we were in Elmira a while, dad came to his new wife and he said, Roxy, uh, I think New York ought to be in our past. He said, New York has not been good for the Comfort family. He said, I suggest that we move down to your roots in Asheville, North Carolina, and begin life anew down there. And of course, my stepmother was thrilled to hear that. So we got on the bus in Elmira, got off the bus in Asheville, North Carolina, and with three children and a wife, my dad had one quarter in his pocket, one quarter. He said, Roxy, what are we going to do? We don't have a house. We don't have a job. And my stepmother said, Bill, I've got an aunt, Aunt Roxy, that runs a boarding house on Patton Avenue. And I think Aunt Roxy will keep us until we can get established. Well, we went down to uh, Aunt Myrtle's boarding house, and right away there was a head-on collision. My dad was a thoroughbred Yankee, Aunt Myrtle was a thoroughbred Southerner, and they were at each other's throat all the time. There was a civil war going on in that boarding house. One night, my stepmom and my dad got drunk. They got in a fight, and they were taken to jail. Aunt Myrtle called the police to come and get them, take them to jail. The lady next door asked if she could keep us until mom and dad were released from jail. You know who that lady was? Her son was a Baptist preacher known all over the state of North Carolina for his preaching. I went by Miss Tiller's bedroom that night. And I saw Miss Tiller on her knees, and I watched the tears come down her face, and I heard her pray and cry, Oh, God, save Bill and Roxy Comfort behind bars tonight. Oh, God, save Billy and Elner and Ronnie Comfort. And that was the first person I'd ever met in my life who impressed me as caring anything about Ron Comfort. I was 13 years old. I woke up in closing. My... Dad uh, and stepmom and I were the only ones in the home. Billy, my brother, had joined the military to get out of the house at 17. My sister was married at 16 to get out of the house. I was the only one left at home. And about 6 o'clock in the morning, I heard my stepmother tell my dad this, Bill, I hate Ronnie. 
I wish we could get him out of our house. Now, Dad knew that I heard that. And he came to me and said, don't pay any attention. Your stepmother is in menopause. And she's in the change of life. She says things she doesn't mean. But I'll tell you what, folks. Nothing could soothe my heart that morning. As I lay in bed, I began to weep. And I said, oh, God, I don't want to see a daybreak. I don't want to see a sunrise. I don't want to see anybody. Nobody loves me. My brother joined the military, was in Panama City, Florida. One Saturday, he and his buddy were on their way downtown to get drunk. Now, my brother had already been taken to the house of prostitution by our dad. And so Billy had lived a wicked life. And so as they were on their way downtown to get drunk, there was an outdoor meeting going on. And my brother told his buddy, he said, let's sit down and listen to that preacher. And they did. And the preacher preached a simple gospel message. And when he got ready to close, he said, I'm going to close in prayer. And if God has spoken to your heart, you'd like to have your sins forgiven. You'd like to know you're on your way to heaven. Come down and talk to me after I close in prayer. He closed in prayer. Billy told his buddy, he said, I'm going to go down and talk to that preacher. And he came to the preacher and he said, Preacher, you said I could know my sins were forgiven. He said, I've got a whole lot of them. He said, you said I could know that I was on my way to heaven. He said, I'd like to know that. Will you tell me how? And so Billy got down on his knees that day and was born again. He did not go downtown and get drunk. He went back to the barracks, wrote his little brother a letter to his mom and dad, and he said, Mom and Dad, Ronnie, I've been saved, and I want you to have what I have. Billy was in Norfolk for a long time. He pastored Victory Baptist Church on Kempsville Avenue, and uh, Billy was all on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ. He came home on furlough, and nine out of ten days, he preached to his little brother. He said, Ronnie, you think nobody loves you? I've got good news. Jesus loves you, and he wants to save you today. And because of that, his little brother got saved. You know, I don't believe there was a person in town that Zacchaeus could have pointed to and said, there goes a person that loves me. There goes a person that loves me. But now he met Jesus. And I can hear him as he sang, I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. And that day, Zacchaeus was saved. And ladies and gentlemen, you can be saved too. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. No one's looking around. I'm going to ask the pianist to come and play softly and tenderly. Jesus is calling. With our heads bowed and eyes closed as pastor comes to the platform and helps me look for hands. Let me ask you, how many of you this morning can say, Preacher, if I died right now, I can give you a Bible reason why I know I'm saved. I, I, there was a time and a place when I realized I was a sinner, that I could not get to heaven by my good works. I received Christ, and my life was changed. And if I died right now, I can give you a Bible reason why I know I'd go to heaven. If you can do that, would you raise your hand, please, right now? If you're not sure, don't be lying, raise your hand. All right, God bless you. Thank you. There are several who could not raise their hand. You know, you can be saved right where you sit. Did you know that? Now, you've got to know these four things. Number one, that you're a sinner. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Number two, you must realize that your good works will not take you to heaven. Number three, you must realize that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and he vindicated his claim as the son of God by rising from the dead. And number four, you must ask him to come into your life and be your Lord and Savior. You can be saved right where you sit. If you would like to be saved right where you sit, would you just bow your head, close your eyes, and pray after me this simple prayer. 
and pray it sincerely. Here's the prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I'm not worthy of your love. But Jesus Christ died on the cross for me. And I want to live for him. Come into my life and take away my sins and be my Lord and Savior for Jesus' sake. Now with our heads bowed, uh, Pastor Brother Mark and I are watching. How many of you in the building can say, Preacher, I just prayed that prayer in my heart. And as a testimony to you and the pastors, I want to raise my hand to let you know I just prayed that prayer and I meant it. If you just prayed that prayer and you meant it, would you slip up your hand, please? God bless you over here on my right. God bless you and you. That's three at least. Anybody else? I just prayed that prayer and I meant it. Yes, God bless you toward the back in the center. That's four. Anybody else? Pray for me. God bless you over here on my left. Yes, God bless you. That's at least five. I just prayed that prayer and I meant it. Anybody else along with these? Anybody else? Anybody else? All right, those five of you that prayed that prayer, would you lift your head and look at me just a moment, please? Nobody's looking but you and me. This is just between us. Now, when you said I prayed that prayer, did you mean it? How about you? How about you, sir? Did you mean it? Did you, ma'am? All right, if you meant it when you prayed that prayer, God had to save you. Because his promise is this, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do you understand that? Do you understand that there toward the back? All right, now if you leave and you don't let somebody take their Bible and give you assurance from the Bible, you'll leave and you'll not know for sure you're really saved. So in a moment we'll stand. I'm going to pray for you and then we'll give the invitation if you meant it the moment you come there'll be a man or a woman to take the bible give you assurance and give you some literature as to what you need to do now that you've received christ so if you meant it when you prayed that prayer i expect you to come all right let's pray father i thank you that you brought my wife and me 350 miles or so just to be here this morning and you not only brought my wife and me here but you brought these unsaved friends here this morning and I thank you that they've listened so well and I pray that it'll not be a matter of listening with their ears but rather listening with their hearts and I pray that one day they'll be able to look back at this closing time of March of 2023 and remember on Sunday morning they were born again. Lord, I pray that every one of them who's prayed that prayer will come and let us give them assurance from the Bible. Bless the personal workers, give them wisdom as they deal with these in Jesus' name. Let's stand, please. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. We're going to sing softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. All right, those five of you that said, I prayed that prayer, if you meant it, slip out of your seat right now. There'll be a personal worker to meet you and give you assurance from the Bible. All right, God bless you as we sing. Soft.
Edmund speak in the play another stanza. This is for you. We've had several come this morning. There are others who said, I prayed that prayer, but you haven't come. If you meant it, slip out of your place right now as they continue to play. up this way. Thank you for listening so well this morning. God has been working in hearts. If you're a little uncomfortable this morning, I'm going to say this in love. There was a time when I was in a service like this and I was uncomfortable too. But I gave my life to Christ and I discovered what was uncomfortable is the Holy Spirit touching my heart saying, I love you. I want to save you. Okay? So that's, it's, this has not been human manipulation or anything like that. It's God graciously poking because he wants you to be in heaven with him forever. But that doesn't happen because we're religious or, or any of that. It's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And just like you have a physical birthday, you have to have a spiritual birthday or you'll never see heaven as your home. And so as we're dismissed, talk to one of us. Dr. Comfort, talk to one of us, the pastoral staff that you've seen here. If a friend from Good News invited you, have a conversation with them. Do that this afternoon, okay? Um, this life is preparation for the next, and we only get one pass here and then eternity. So give, give your heart uh, to Christ. Uh, again, we want to invite our guests to the hospitality area. Uh, our next time together is going to begin in here at quarter after, and so if you need to slip out, we want to invite you to come right back. Dr. Comfort uh, will be speaking to us again. Father, thank you for your word, the clarity of it. Thank you for the example of Zacchaeus. Now for 2,000 years, that short man has been in heaven. Uh, he was a tax collector. He was, in our modern vernacular, an IRS guy. But you loved him. By the way, he's up there with a disciple named Matthew who also had been a tax collector. Lord, you love the whole world. You want to save anybody who will humbly admit their need. If there's anyone who yet needs to be saved, Lord, would today be the day. Continue working in their lives. Lord, we want to close by again thanking you for all these special guests today. Lord, would you bless them for honoring their friend and accepting an invitation. And uh, Lord, uh, go before us now. Uh, meet with us in the next hour as well. And we'd love to have our guests stay also in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.